Unafraid Show Daily Live. Today, we got a special guest in the building to talk some college football with us. It's our man, Jordan Reffitt. And if you are a Washington fan, you clearly know who this man is. The most optimistic man about Washington football I have ever met and ever talked to. Uh, Jordan, thanks for coming on the show, man. Hey, man, I appreciate it. I love it, man. I, I got so much respect for what you're doing, and, and I, I love your show, and, and, and keep killing it, man. And, and absolutely, that's that's how I keep my sanity, is being an optimistic Washington fan. <laughs> so you got a chance to, to experience the Kalen DeBoer experience for two years up there at Washington. And then you got a chance to see him beat Georgia this weekend. How, how was that feeling for a Washington fan? Because you're like, that was supposed to be our guy. Is it like watching your 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 ex girlfriend go get married to like the the president or something? Yeah, no, it's wild. You know, it's kind of you bring that up. It was you know we were watching our you know our our, our ex best friend or ex girlfriend out there, and and um, you know you're kind of not watching it. You're like, oh yeah, I don't really want to watch that game, you know. And then it's like the most exciting wild game of the year yeah. so far, and and Coach DeBoer's killing it, and and you know I, for me. I have I have great things and great memories with Coach DeBoer, and so thankful for the for the time that he that he gave us at UW because he's such a special coach, and we saw that so far. Um, obviously, even at Alabama, but with, with what he's done at UW, I got nothing but love for him. But it was kind of like, man, what could have been if we could have continued that ride at UW? And uh, but it was it was one of those games where you're sitting there thinking, is this game ever gonna ever gonna end? us going back and yeah. forth to the you know that Coach DeBoer just wins. He's a winner. I mean, he, yep. he, he, he finds a way to win those close games. Yeah, and it, it was funny because, you know, the Big, T, uh, the Big 12 and even the Pac-12 got so much flack from the SEC. Oh, my God, look at all those scores. There's no defense being, being played. And I was like, yo, that was a Pac-12 after dark game if I've ever seen one. Yeah. It was 41 to 34. So, and these SEC teams, all of a sudden, it's, that's so much defense. It's amazing what happens when you get some good offensive minds and some good quarterbacks in your conference. Then all of a sudden, oh, we, we, we ain't worried about the defense so much. Right, exactly. That's what's so funny about it. You know, it's like all of a sudden now you got Kalen DeBoer and actually a real offense running down there in, in, in Alabama and you see guys where, you know, they're, they're, they're putting up tons of points and it's like, oh man, what an exciting brand of football. We love this. Now it's in the <laughs> We've been doing that in the Pac-12 for 20 years, 30 years. So relax, buddy. We know what we're doing. Yeah, and one of the things that I keep trying to tell uh, people in general is about the SEC because they only play eight conference games. And they're like, it's such a gauntlet. And I'm like, listen, the conference has been propped up for the last 10 plus years by Bama and Georgia. They've been doing all the heavy lifting aside from that 2019 LSU team. And like, aside from them, the conferences are very equal. And the SEC has a losing record in the nine conference in the last two years, too. So I'm like, it's time to go to nine conference games. Stop this grift. And then they'll be like, look at Ohio State's schedule this year. Yeah, it's bad, too, in the non-conference. But they're still playing nine Power Five games, which makes it literally an SEC schedule. So they can't complain about that. But I'm going to complain because as a college football fan, Jordan, I, it just hurts me because I love college football. Everybody knows I'm an Oregon guy, but I love college football even more than I love Oregon. And... It's not right for the sport for us to like waste games. And and it, there's no disparagement upon like the FCS schools or anything like that or or lower tier FBS schools. It's just there should be 10 of those games because you only get 12 opportunities. Yeah. No, absolutely. I think one of the big things that, that I brought up throughout the years, too, especially, you know, in, in the early part of the season, um, you know, the SEC gets propped up, you know, through the whole media, right? The yep. media, the media bias. And, and it's not just the East Coast bias. It's really the SEC bias. And and you look at the conference game, especially when the Pac-12 was tough with with Oregon being good and then Utah being good and then UW got good. You know, that was a gauntlet through that. Oregon State was good at times. I mean, you had a, a, a system in the, in the Pac-12 where you had nine conference games and you had four or five teams that, that weren't ranked on your schedule. And uh, to me, I think that maybe that gets missed when you talk about the SEC because, you know, you look at what, what happened to Ole Miss this weekend. They get beat by Kentucky. 
right? Yep. Um, you know, these teams, they go out there and play these lower tier teams in the SEC, but they're propped up by the media. They only have eight conference games. Now, all of a sudden, you know, they're, they're, they're able to easily be in the top 25 because they're getting to seven, eight wins almost automatically, right? Yep. And so they're playing lower team SEC teams. And then they, you know, I mean, I think there was some crazy stat about Georgia where they had only played, uh, you know, an away game against a ranked team in, in conference like three times in 20 years. Yes. There were some of these like outlandish, you know, stats coming out of the SEC, whether it was LSU or Georgia or Alabama. And they had these outrageous stats where it's like, man, in the in the Pac-12 or the Big Ten, some of these conferences, you're playing on the road every week and you got three, you know, uh, uh, conference opponents that are all ranked. So yep. to me, things that got to be looked at when you look at the SEC, and you're right, as a college football fan, it's not right. That eight-game season, I mean, or conference schedule is, is, is totally weak because when you think about it, you know, if you had an eight-game conference schedule and you're playing Bandy and you're playing Kentucky, obviously they think um, – Mississippi State is absolutely atrocious this year. Yes. They're like, like an FBS school, right? Or, I mean, FCS school. I mean, so to me, you got three three dubs right there. I mean, there's so many things that, that they look at in the SEC when they talk about, um, you know, it just means more. Well, Alabama and Georgia, yes. LSU, like you said, in 2019, yes, they were unreal teams. They deserved the national championship and all the limelight. But all the teams in the SEC are not great. Let's Thank be honest. Yes, you know I mean? and they're like, oh. look at recruiting rankings. Well, if if your teams are so good, you wouldn't be losing to Arizona State. You wouldn't be losing – Auburn wouldn't be losing to Cal if y'all are so great, if these recruiting rankings are just so so right. Well, yeah. <laughs> it, Cal been into, Cal's been in SEC country several times. Freaking yep. Cal. Think about Cal. I mean, Cal's been in the SEC country several times and got dubs. I mean, yep. that, come on. I mean, I think that's one of those things you look at. I mean, I don't think Oregon's lost to Cal in like 20 years. But uh, or uh, Cal goes down to SEC country and gets they beat I think Ole Miss and now they beat uh, Auburn down at Auburn. So yeah. these are games in the last five six years. I mean to me the SEC has been propped up by the eight games uh, conference schedule and the the media bias. I mean don't get me wrong, Alabama, Georgia, and when LSU was great, those teams were phenomenal and they yes. deserve all. But you cannot tell me that that is top to bottom. Just amazing. Yeah. Well, it, it's it's because yeah. they they subscribe to the theory, and I remember reading about about this in a paper a long time ago, where it was like the we won, they lost. So when Mississippi State loses, they're like, oh, see, they just they just suck. When Georgia knocked the, the doors off of uh, Oregon a few years ago, see, look at the SEC, they can't hang with us. You're like oh. us? No, it's them. Y'all couldn't hang with them either. Right. Um, I love but, that. Yeah, I love the SEC trying to put their arm around, you know, uh, Georgia, everybody in that group saying, hey, look at what we did to Oregon. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. That was, that we was didn't Georgia, do anything. Yeah, yeah, we didn't do anything. We, we, you speak French now? <laughs> no. Yeah, exactly. That's why I'm like, come on now. There ain't no we in this situation. Georgia was nasty that game. I mean, that was just one of those games that happened. But yeah, there ain't no we in this situation. Yep. Uh, but now we're going to get to the games. We got five games to talk about this weekend and um i'm actually gonna we're actually gonna start with your alma mater the washington huskies they are hosting the michigan wolverines and you know they say the 90s are back when it comes to the music the fashion but did anybody expect to see the 2024 michigan wolverines fresh off of a national championship step back into the time machine back into the 1990s and have to run the Nebraska Corn Huskers Big Eight offense. They just sitting here. They 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 might as well bring Tommy Frazier out right now. They have averaged eighty three passing yards per game over the last three games, and that would have been good for a hundred and thirty third out of one hundred and thirty four in the FBS in twenty twenty three. They even rank behind the triple option service academies. Oh, so no. with Michigan going out there to Washington and. This is really a replay of last year's national championship game. But honestly, these two teams couldn't be any different at this point than they were last year. How do you see this game, Jordan? Well, you know, I'm glad you brought that up. I mean, it's everybody talks about, hey, is there a revenge factor? And it's like, well, 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 well damn, I mean, the, the UW team's like got like 60 new guys. and <laughs> They don't even know, you know, they, they weren't around. I mean, you know, and a whole new staff. And, and so... Obviously, for the fans, I mean, this is a huge game and, and the revenge and all that stuff. When it comes to the players, 
And when you actually kind of look at this game and break it down, um, you know, a lot of people were surprised to see that UW was favored uh, when the line came out. I'm not yeah. sure. I haven't looked at it today. Uh, but UW yeah, it was favored. it was two the last time. It was two when I looked last night. Yeah, and, and when UW uh, is playing at home, a lot of people don't know because obviously this year they, they've had some losses and they've, they've been down at times, but they have a uh, the second longest uh, home winning streak. Play, win, you know, winning a Husky Stadium – the last several years has been really tough with, with coach. People Cabral. don't know what it's like to go up there on Mont, Mont Lake, bro. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that is a very I mean, tough place to win. Exactly. It's loud. And, and, and when the winds are swollen, those kicks, they just seem to go a little bit to the right. And uh, it's one of those things where um, this game really matches up well, I think, for Washington. You know, they're, they're kind of on the cusp of, of being a pretty dang good football team. They've shown it between the 20s. I mean, I, I think when you, when you look at efficiency – Yards per play on offense. Will Rogers has been extremely efficient. He's got 10 touchdowns, no interceptions. Um, he, he's one of those guys that's just really steady, doesn't make mistakes, um, and, and doesn't throw interceptions or turn the ball over. But uh, what, the way I see this working out is Washington's got to stop the run. Yep. Just like the national championship game. I mean, J.J. McCarthy made a couple throws, but they won that game because they, they pounded the rock, and they were able yep. to run the football against Washington and really break those big runs early on, and Washington wasn't able to recover. So I think I see a very similar game to the Rutgers-UW game, unfortunately, where I think UW's going to load the box and, and, and try to stop the run. But I also think that UW can score on this defense. This is not the defense from, from Michigan uh, last no. year. I mean, they, they have some really good players, but Washington's got some good players too, and I think they're getting some confidence right now. And playing a Husky Stadium when that place is full and rocking, it, it'll really, it really does. It makes it electric, and I think it really lights the guys up. And I see UW uh, finding a way to win this game here at home. Yeah, and you were right that both of them teams combined to bring back only seven starters from last year, and only one of them was on offense. And now you talked about that Rutgers game because I got a chance to watch it. There were some, you know, like some unfortunate penalties and some unfortunate calls that went against Washington, those 50-50 calls or plays. But – at the end of the day, you you brought it up because Rutgers ran for 184 yards on, on the ground. But I think that this Washington team is much more dangerous than that three and two record suggests because of the quarterback, Will Rogers, and because he's been efficient. So he's not going to throw the ball all over the place. And I think that the Washington defense is going to load up the box and double dog dare them to to throw the football. Like I, I'm honestly, I might be playing zero coverage a lot. Like if, if you, if if Alex, if you're willing to let Alex Orgy throw the throw the ball, so be it. He gonna have to throw it to beat us. Cause what you're not gonna do is is run the ball on us. Like I'm not allowing that at all. No, and and I think people um, really can be excited, Husky fans and even college football fans, that the, the way that uh, Coach Belichick has ran that defense there up at Washington has been really efficient and actually he's done some really cool things in, in terms of, 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 of disguising coverages and, and, and loading the box. And then also you talk about zero coverages and zero blitzes. He's been able to find a way uh, to, to really put some guys on the back end at Washington, Thad Dixon. Um, uh, he's one of the top corners. I think really uh, Eliza Jackson, obviously um, you have uh, Jordan Shaw, some of these young guys on the back end at Washington, you can lead those guys to where they're in a position because of their speed and athleticism to where you can get after that quarterback and load that box up and dare uh, Michigan to throw it. So I think you're going to see a lot of exotic stuff, actually, too, where I think we're going to try to confuse uh, Alex Orgy to where he's in a situation where if he does throw it, hope he throws it to the other guys in purple because he's going to be getting – it's going to be loud. I mean, I'm yeah. talking this loud. It's going to be yes. like the Orgy. I think last year, and and you got to be able to make plays when it's loud and under pressure. That's what we're going to see Alex Orgy face this weekend. Yeah, and it was a and it's an afternoon game too, so the fans going to be all sauced up and ready yeah. <laughs> ready to go. So uh, I want to bring a couple stats to your attention. So Washington's yeah. losses are to Washington State and to Rutgers, but I didn't look as it as of not them not being able to finish because they really could be five and zero right now. Because in the Apple Cup, they outgained Wazoo didn't turn the ball over, got inside the Cougars' 25-yard line five times for a total of 12 points. And then you had Jed Fish, who I like. They, Them and the staff, they ran that awful toss play on fourth and goal from the one that could have been the game. 
yeah, could have been the game winning touchdown. And then against Rutgers, the Huskies dominated the ball. They ran for, oh, well, they had a total of 521 yards to only 299 for Rutgers, but they missed three field goals, two for 12 on third down, and decided to throw the ball twice from the two yard line in the second quarter and turn the ball over on downs inside the five. So, like, if Washington figures out how to operate inside the 25, <laughs> this is going to be a dangerous football team. And I actually like them to beat Michigan. Yeah, no, I love it. And, and one thing that you brought up, too, in that Rutgers game that not a lot of people, I think, really understood was Rutgers was going to kick a field goal, okay? This is right before the half. Rutgers is going to kick a field goal. It is blocked by Washington. Blocked. Yep. Washington's about ready to either scoop and score the ball or jump on the ball. It's Washington football, right? We oh, have a, a, this is heartbreaking. He jumps onto the field. He thought the play was dead or he got too excited. He jumped on the field to celebrate before the play was over. And you know who was right next to him? The, the official. Dude, the zebra. And I was like, oh, and I saw it happen because I started thinking, I'm like, there's no way. There, there's no way. I, I was hoping that the ball was dead, right? And we yeah. were going to get some type of dead ball penalty, right? Because if it's a dead ball penalty, it's fine, Washington ball, 15 yards, whatever they want to do. Excessive celebration, that's fine. But when I found out that obviously the play was was still live and he jumped on the field, he was right in front of the ref, and I seen that UW coach just light him up, I'm like, oh, no. Yeah. He so, couldn't be just 10 yards back further yeah. because they wouldn't have even seen him. Yeah, I mean, that happens. I mean, people just tore that kid up, and I'm like, dude, that happens actually more than you think. I mean, yep. guys – you know, sometimes get on the field during a play, you know, whatever happens. Usually it's not a penalty right away. It does yep. happen. Where, but if the ref sees it and you're right in front of the ref, he's got to call it. Yep. I mean, he's yeah, he it. didn't. Yeah, correct. He didn't like like that wasn't a like that was just an unfortunate m mistake and not like, oh, the refs are against this. No, nah, it was a penalty. No. It just is what it is. Yeah, I mean, it's a penalty, And that's yep. the thing. And what was so tough about that, too, is that, you know, the psyche for the defense, I think, really sucked a lot of life at him right before half. They played well the rest of the game. I mean, yeah. don't give me – they did a lot of good things. But the very next play, Rutgers scores a touchdown instead of, obviously, Husky ball at the 25 or 30 going the other way. So that, to me, was the play of the game uh, in terms of the way that Rutgers won that football game was Washington giving that game away during that, that yep. specific sequence. Not saying it was on the young man. He did not lose the game. But that sequence and several other penalties were were, were just gut wrenching, horrible timing. I mean, you can yep. time it like even worse for the Huskies. So it was one of those things where uh, you come out of that game thinking, "How the heck did we lose that football game?" You know, yeah. if you're oh, watching, yeah. oh, for sure, for sure. So. Um, next game up, Missouri at Texas A and M. Texas A M is minus two. Now after back to back one score wins at home. Missouri, who has not been impressive at all, they got two weeks now, they got last week off, to prepare for their first SEC road game of 2024. And this is them heading out to College Station to play Texas A&M. Now, I went into this year, Jordan, and I was expecting their quarterback, Brady Cook, to be a Heisman contender, and he hasn't done anything to preclude himself from the from the discussion but he hasn't really done anything to justify this hype either and the strength of this missouri offense has been the two fifth year sunbelt transfer running backs nate noel from appalachian state and marcus carroll from georgia state and they got about 600 yards between the two of them which is about what texas a&m has surrendered as a team as a total in the in the five games so when i look at this missouri team i looked at how they struggled against vandy Looked at the other game where they struggled. I was like, ooh, this team, this feels like one of them SEC prop-ups. And it's not that they're a bad team. They're, they're just not, from what they've shown so far, this isn't a top 10 team or a team that can win a national championship. No, I agree 100%. I think that you hit it right on the head. Missouri is one of those teams that had a ton of hype coming into the season because of that SEC machine. And you look at, and I really like their their head coach. I think they've done a lot of really good things, especially the last couple of years. I mean, they, they've had a really great passing attack. But the thing about it is this year, they're more of a running team where they should be throwing the ball over the lot with the teams that they played. They played Vandy. They haven't blown yeah. anybody out. When you look at their schedule, like you said, 
being a top 10, what are they at? Seven, eight in the country or something right now? It's they're similar at to, number nine now. They're at number nine. It's similar to Ole Miss. Ole Miss has got some dudes. I mean, Jackson Dart yeah. and obviously and Kiffin. They got the machine. They got a bunch of dudes. They got a bunch of dudes from UW. Their offensive line is good, right? Because they took two, two dudes from UW. But the, the, they're not in that upper echelon era of teams right now, and they haven't shown it. So to me, it's one of those things where I – isn't Missouri the show me state? You got to yep. show me, right? They got to do something. It really, I don't. I hate to say this because people always say this. You know, people are saying this about UW and, and Michigan, but it's it's a battle of the mids. I mean, I don't think that there are two teams that are going to challenge for an SEC championship. They're just not. Texas A&M is is, is not, and Missouri nope. is not going to challenge anybody for an SEC championship. To me, that conference is so top heavy right now with Alabama and Georgia, and um, Texas. And Texas, well, gosh, Texas. I forget. You get sometimes during the SEC, right? Man, Texas is a juggernaut. I mean, that's that's a whole other show. Texas is unreal right now. Yeah. And the way that they recruited is unreal. But when you look at the SEC, these are two teams that are probably going to finish in the middle of the pack. I can see them being yeah. seven to nine win teams. They're not. This is not going to be uh, challenging for an SEC championship. No, absolutely not. And they still have, so Missouri, after this game against Texas A&M, they play UMass. Ooh, ooh, that'll be a game. Oh, um, what a then, they, then they got Auburn. They play at Alabama, Oklahoma, South Carolina, Mississippi State, and Arkansas on the way out the door. So they're, if they can get through the middle stretch, all right, then the, the end with Mississippi State and Arkansas shouldn't actually be too bad. Um. But now, speaking of the Aggies, though, because they're coming off four straight wins. And Marcel Reed, who they moved to at quarterback instead of Connor Weakman, he has protected the football. And But this Texas A&M offense is as one-dimensional as it gets. And this game is going to come down to which team is able to stop the other team's running game. And and if Missouri, if they can hand, I'm sorry, if Texas A&M can stop Luther Burton when he gets the ball in his hands. Now, you know, because Missouri's been in the SEC since 2012, and this right. is only the second time that they will play Texas A&M since 2015. That's nine Crazy. years. I, that, Crazy. Crazy. That's what an eight-game schedule does for you instead of a nine-game schedule. Now, this Texas A&M team is much better at home than they are on the road, which, you know, they should because Kyle Field is a hard place to play. But Missouri, they've been a very good road team in 2023. So it's going to be interesting, Jordan, to see how this carries over this season. No, absolutely. I think one thing that, uh, that that we haven't talked about is that Missouri's coming in after a bye week, you know, and, and that's one of those things where, you know, it can either really, really help you yep. or sometimes it, it can hurt you, right, because sometimes – you can't get in the groove, but you get some guys back. You know, they're going to have some guys that are going to be healthy. The the ickies and boo-boos, like my old college coach used to call them, they're going to be cleared up. Everybody's going to be feeling <laughs> good. You know, so we're going to see what happens. But but Kyle feels wild, man. You know, I, yeah, I've never – But, I mean, that place is nuts. I mean, people talk about, you know, they, they got all the hillbillies down there and they got the, the outfits and they do all the crazy um, crazy uh, 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 cheerleading stuff. Yes. But it's they... the, the, real. Yes, exactly. And they got <laughs> stuff that you got. Uh, that's wild. Yes, it definitely is. So who are you taking in this game, Jordan? So for me, just because um, it's actually tough, but because Texas A&M is at home, and uh, like I said, the, the home of the 12th man, and like I said, I have not seen enough from Missouri. Texas, Texas A&M is tested. I mean, they played Notre Dame down the wire. I mean, this yep. is a team that's tested. I'm going to take Texas A&M at home. I'm going to take Texas A&M at home, too. And, you know, and then depending on how close the game is, because Texas A&M is now ranked 25th, um, they will either skyrocket up the rankings. They'll be like, they're a top 10 team now. <laughs> or And then um, Missouri will I mean, fall to, like, 12. I that, dude, if Texas A&M wins, it's going to be a love fest, man. It's gonna oh, be my in gosh. It. And they're only going to drop Missouri, like, two spots. Missouri's going to be, like, 11 or 12. And they'll be like, man, the SEC is just – Top to bottom. I'm Just crazy. rank the whole conference. <laughs> um, so next game up, we got Ole Miss at South Carolina. Oh, boy. Now, Ole Miss took an L last week at home against Kentucky. And now they're going to play literally Kentucky all over again 
with yeah. uh, with South Carolina. But the difference is, is that South Carolina is a little bit more explosive, particularly at the quarterback position, because Lenore Sellers, the, the, the man with the rec specs, is going to be back. So oh, yeah. uh cause cause he actually got hurt in that LSU game that they lost. And I actually thought that they win that game if they what? don't well actually they win that game if they don't after they got the pick six, if they, they didn't shot. touch the quarterback. Just yeah, why no, did he hit the quarterback? Yeah. yeah. So they win okay. that game. Right. And I think that Ole Miss is swimming in the deep end right here. Yeah. But if they can win this game. This is the, one of them character games, Jordan. Like, you, you know and I know that there are times where either you get beat or you win, and then you got to come back and figure out who you really are. So Ole Miss, this is one of them games that's going to send this season in one direction or the other. Because this, because nobody on this Ole Miss offense, they better not be making eye contact with anybody on that defense this week. <laughs> because Jackson, Dart, Lane, Kiffin, and the Ole Miss offense – Wasted a five sack, ten tackle for loss performance by the defense against Kentucky at home, and I know that Kentucky is tough. They played Georgia tough, but this is one of the most disappointing losses so far of the entire college football season. If you take away all everything that Florida State has done, <laughs> and now the Rebels have to travel to Columbia, and South Carolina is going to take on a team that smacked Kentucky. Remember, they beat Kentucky by twenty five. I was going to say, yeah, that they thumped on Kentucky, and South Carolina is nobody to play with. You know, I mean, no. I know that people try to act like South Carolina is like one of that, like, super low-tier Vandy-type schools, but actually, South Carolina is a serious football school. They take football serious there. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, they're going to pack that place, and it's going to be loud, and they're going to be wild because they're going to smell the blood in the water. And when you talk about kind of finding out who you are as a team, this is where Ole Miss really has to find a way to dig deep because – You cannot let Kentucky beat you twice, right? Because this is that situation where, you know, and and you got to flush it. You got to, okay, we didn't play our A game. We find a way to lose. We got to, we got to, we got to, we got to move on, right? They got to have a clean break from that Kentucky game and they got to put their best foot forward against South Carolina. And if they do, if Jackson Dart plays well, if they, they don't turn the ball over, if they play smart, sound football, they can beat South Carolina, but South Carolina is going to be hungry. And to me, Obviously, physically, physically and, and skill-wise, um, Ole Miss is the better football yes. team. I don't think there's any question about that. But, like I said, it's going to be like the mentality of Ole Miss. Are they going to come into this game? Poor me. Man, we were a top-10 team. We had all this stuff going for us. Now it's all down the drain. Or are they going to come and say, hey, that's not us. We're going to find a way to come in here and thump South Carolina. So we'll see. I mean, the, I really like Ole Miss's offensive line. Because I know a couple of dudes on there that went from UW to Ole Miss. They have a really good senior-laden offensive line. They got a quarterback that can really play. I mean, he was a guy that could have been in the Heisman conversation, obviously, and still might be. I mean, it's early in the season. So, I mean, like you said, I'm with you. It's it's one of two ways. Either either, uh, excuse me, either um, Ole Miss is going to come in and and honestly just kind of come in and 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 crap down their leg, and 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 the season's going to go down the toilet, or Ole Miss is going to rise above and really play up to their potential, and then maybe, maybe find a way to threat for an SEC championship. And I think this we're going to learn a lot about Lane Kiffin in this team because yeah. each of his first seasons in Oxford, every time they lost, they won the next game. But this mm. time around, it's going to be against a tougher opponent than what they've done in their right. in their other games. And they got one – and South Carolina has like two of the nation's most – like best pass rushers in Kyle Kennard and Dylan Stewart. Them Kennard's dudes are stud. yes, absolutely. Stud. Dude, dude, you do not want him on the on the other side. If he could get drafted this year, the freshman, he absolutely would. And oh, absolutely. and I think that Ole Miss is like the the prime example and Florida State this year. Well, 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 Florida State for sure. But we're gonna see if Ole Miss is or not where you can pull in all these big-time transfer portal classes, kids that went to other universities, all of this stuff. But the difference is between building a team and building a roster because it takes a while for people to get into your culture. And and there's a difference between learning a system and mastering a system. And you can't master a system in, in, in 
you know, just spring ball and then come, you know, yes, you're meeting with the coaches, but a lot of it is time on task. And so you don't actually get to mastery until you get to, you know, two thirds of the way through the season. But then by then you might have already taken L's. Right. 100%. Well, you might not even master it until a year or two in the system. I mean, yep. this is, you know, I mean, you don't know, want UW Homer, but you got to go back to UW. I mean, that's why I think they're they're struggling to, to, to win some of these games because that roster is is of a bunch of Arizona dudes, a bunch of other tra- transfers. Then you got the OG Washington guys that played in the national championship. Then you got the young UW guys. Then you got new recruits that come in from Arizona and UW recruits. So putting rosters together is so much it's so crazy right now in college football, right? So, and Ole Miss was, had money, you know, down south in the SIP, come to the SIP. They had Lane Kiffin in the Lambo. Yep. They're bringing all these big time transfers. So you're exactly right because bringing all those guys together, there's a locker room component, I think, in Ole Miss too, right? Where who's the leader of that locker room? Because you're bringing in leaders from other teams, right? Leaders from Washington, leaders from Florida State, leaders from Alabama that are now all in one locker room at Ole Miss. So who takes the lead? Is it Lane Kiffin? Is it some of these players? Who You know, they really have to find out who what the leadership aspect is. And and because with these teams that bring in a bunch of transfers, there's little clicks, right? There's clicks yep. of guys that just came in. There's clicks of guys that have been there for a while. Then there's the OG guys. So, I mean, there's a lot of little clicks in these locker rooms. So it can fracture easily, right? Yep. So I think that's why you see a lot of these teams. Florida State's a great example. I mean, of just no leadership, right? I mean, they, they cannot put it together. And so that's a great point, man. I think that's a great thing to bring up in terms of this game and, and really Ole Miss. And on the road, are they going to galvanize and really come together with a group of dudes that came from all over, ton of talent? I mean, they got a ton of talent. But are they going to be able to galvanize and be a team and go find a way to win against a really good South Carolina team? I mean, not really good, but a good, yeah, solid. Yeah, a good, solid. Yeah, they, they are a road. tough out. Like, they're a tough out week in and week out. Where p- people were upset because when I do my rankings every single week, I base them on what I think are the three most important criteria that, like, the AP poll and other polls and computers and all this stuff that they don't really take into account. It is, I do, in order, quality wins, schedule played, and dominance. And the reason why I put dominance last is because you have Ole Miss dominated everybody. You had Mississippi State, their first game of the season, they won by like 55 points or something like that. So you can dominate, but if you don't play anybody that's competitive, that that's what you're supposed to do. And right. Ole Miss, the first time that they played anybody that was even remarkably, even a little bit competitive in Kentucky, they they lost. And now they're nine point favorites and people were like, how do you have them ranked 22? Well, they haven't beat anybody in the first team that they played. It was an unranked team and they lost. So right. how am I supposed to, I, I know they're talented, yeah. but this team, but this game. Yeah. Yeah. But are they, are they a good football team? Who, do, who the hell knows? And now they are nine point favorites headed into Columbia. I'm, I am going to take the points on this one. I, I need the points. It'll make me feel better. I'm taking South Carolina and them nine points. 100%. No, to me, I'm, I'm with you, man, because this, to me, is such a trap game for Ole Miss after what happened. And like you said, yep. this is why we talk about rankings all the time. And there's there's guys all over Twitter. There's guys all over the nation, journalists, guys like you and me that talk all the time and, and polls and stuff. The polls are so terrible early on in the season because we don't know. No. Especially this, like that's the way that you do it is perfect because right now the way college football is, we don't know the rosters like we used to know. Yep. You know, like Phil would come out. I love that Phil Steele magazine back when we were playing. You knew the roster up and down because guys didn't go anywhere. Everybody yes. was there. They were developing guys. You know, you knew what they were going to do and what they were about. So right now, Ole Miss has got a – it's similar to, to Missouri and some of these teams, too, who haven't beaten anybody and really haven't dominated, is you got to show me – if you go into South Carolina and beat South Carolina by 10 points after losing to an unranked team at home, yep. to me, I'm going to be a believer in Ole Miss. But until then, I am not a believer in Ole Miss. I, I think that Lane Kiffin is a guy that is a lot of flash. We haven't seen a ton of substance. Right. You know, I mean, he's a good recruiter, brings in great dudes, 
But really, in game, I mean, he got out coached in that Kentucky game, I think, badly. And so yeah. when you look at the game, give me South Carolina. Give me the points. I might even buy a point and get to get to 10 points. If I got to 11, I, I might bet the farm on it. I don't know if I <laughs> right? South Carolina uh, plus I might take the whole the whole farm and put it on there. But, yeah, I just I, this is going to be a tough game. It's going to be a slobber knocker, too, because South Carolina is going to be hungry, too. Oh, for sure. And people are, they've lo looked at the rankings. They're like, George, how could you have a uh, Penn State above Oregon and Ohio State? I was like, honestly, I don't necessarily believe that Penn State is better than either one of those teams. But when you look at what Penn State, who Penn State, they have beat multiple power five opponents and yes. they have, you know, their defense looks really good. I'm still not a huge Drew Aller fan, but what they've done and being that Penn, that uh, Ohio State played their first Power 5 game last week, and it was against uh, Michigan State, they haven't played anybody. They played like Akron, Marshall, who's not even good this year, like I, I and Western Kentucky, I believe. So, no, yeah. I don't know anything about Ohio State. They've been extremely dominant. They are talented, but I won't – like there's nothing to judge until – they, you know, until they play somebody and the first game that they're going to play somebody is October 12th. So I actually wonder how that game uh, against Oregon is going to be October 12th because it's on the road. It's their first playing anybody that's going to have a pulse and you might get smacked in the mouth because you're not quite ready for oh. that when when Oregon has already played and people, I think, underestimated that Boise State game. Because I don't think they necessarily played well, but that running back, Ashton Jeansy, boy, he is. Ooh, that dude is a beat. I mean, Boise State to me is a top 15 team right now, the way that they played, even with the loss. Because yep. to me, Oregon right now, with their talent and, and the way that, that, I mean, they built a machine down there. And, and right now, Boise State went in there and smacked them in the mouth and could have come out of there with a victory. Then yep. they go and thump Washington State, who's a borderline top 25 team, you know, yep. top 35 team. So to me, Boise State is the truth because that running back, you can't stop him. I mean, yep. I don't care. I've seen so many guys bounce off this dude. I, it's it's like he's made of rubber. It's unreal. Yes. Yes. It's unreal. He, he yeah. is, uh, he's yeah. averaging t 10 yards a carry, like on the season. It is <laughs> unbelievable. Or Crazy. and and Oregon held him down to seven and seven point seven yards a carry. It, it's yeah. unbelievable. And no, I think that the two best running backs in the country, Ashton Jinty, and then you have Jonah Coleman up there at Washington. That dude is for real. Like people they gonna they gonna they gonna learn when they see that that Michigan game. They gonna learn oh, yeah. about Jonah Coleman. That dude's a oh, yeah. monster. The guy I've never seen a guy where he runs lower because he's only like five. I don't know, he's short. Let's say he's five. Yeah, he's five eight, nine. The guy runs like he's like three foot tall, I mean, and he runs fast, and yep. his knees high off the ground. You know what I mean? And, and he's just a bowling ball, and he's a guy. How are you going to get underneath a guy like that? That's why he does so well, and he catches the ball in the backfield. Yep. The guy hurdle people, even though he's five foot nine. But, yeah, that, that Jonah Coleman show, he's unreal. The, the, the Aston Gentry, I mean, the guy at Boise State, I don't know if we've seen a running back like that in a long time. Yeah. To me – what he's done this year is is so impressive. I mean, I hate to bring up like you know the guys like Reggie Bush and stuff and like those guys, but like no, he's, he's built out of that. He's built out of he's built out of special. Yes, he is first round NFL pick. I mean, he's a guy that can take the ball and score at any time. But I think you're right about Ohio State, and I, I agree with you on Penn State, where they're, they're more battle tested. They were on the road and, and beat West Virginia. They, they've had they've had Power Five opponents that they've had to play that were good teams, solid teams, and they, they found a way to win the game. I think they're kind of like Michigan last year. I don't think they're as talented as Michigan, yeah. but they're that defense, knock you down, only pass it a handful of times, ball control, special teams. Penn State's a good team. But Oregon, to me, that Ohio State game, I think Ohio State's going to get – I can see it being like that Alabama-Georgia game mm -hmm. where they, they come out and kind of get just – just, just the shit kicked out of them for yep. the, the first half. Exactly. Where overwhelmed, the stadium's loud, it's wild. People are going to go nuts for that game in Oregon. And I can see them going, getting down like, you know, 14 nothing, 21 nothing, 21 7, and then finally maybe coming back to making it a game. Yep. Uh, 
because that's going to be the first game where they're really, really tested with dudes that are as fast as them, as athletic as them, <laughs> yep. as tough as them. So it's going to be it's going to be interesting to me because um, Ohio State's schedule, for whatever reason, and I don't blame them because there's stuff that happens with the schedule and stuff. But you've got to find a way to at least go play like Penn State, go play West Virginia or yeah. Pitt or you know somebody to yep. where you get game in. You know that's uh, that's going to help you see where you're at because I don't think they even know where where, where Ohio State's at right oh, now. For sure, but their QB situation, just like last year, they don't have that elite QB. That's no. why I think, Oregon, and even Washington. I know Washington's three and two, but that steadiness and and experience at the QB makes such a big difference in these big games as you get later in the season. November yeah, and, and Will Howard, who came over from Kansas State, longtime starter, but he wasn't running the same type of offense that he's running now. And right. to have to make them high leverage throws, which he ran the ball a lot more at Kansas State, it's going to be very interesting. Uh, now a game that I'm super excited about. <laughs> I, I couldn't, and, and it sounds weird, but Cal is hosting game day. They're yes. playing against Miami. And now there are only four or five teams left that have never hosted game day. Miami's a 10 and a half point favorite. And I do not think that, and I tweeted this and my, I tweeted this a week ago and Miami fans were like, Oh, what are you talking about? It's going to be no problem. I was like, this is a seven 30 kick at Cal. This, I, I know it's the ACC, but this is Pac-12 after dark. You are swimming in the deep end. You don't know what you do not understand. Brother. <laughs> yeah, you do not understand. Weird things happen after the ball gets kicked off. If, if any kickoff happens after 7 o'clock Pacific time, weird things happen. So Miami may win this game, but it but but they will take damage. They, yeah. <laughs> something will happen. It will be 86-85. It'll yeah. be, you know, oh, they'll fun. lose. Something will happen. Yeah, all bets are off. All bets are off when you come to the West Coast, baby. All bets are off. You know, and, and really, I was trying to look back, too, and I didn't have a lot of time, but I'm trying to look back on the last time Miami's been out to the West Coast. It might have been back in, like, 2001 when they went to UW and got thumped. You know, so Miami teams, East Coast teams coming out to the West Coast, it's not it's not a, a gimme game. I don't care yeah. how more talented you are. I don't care if you think you're the That's better football That's a 1030 body clock kick, bro. That's what I'm saying. You're playing, you're playing, uh, you know, uh, there's a three hour time difference. All of this stuff that's going against Miami and they're thinking they're going to come in and just wax Cal. Cal, I mean, Cal's a defensive football team. Cal went to Auburn. It's not like they're, they're not uncomfortable with an SEC level of physicality. They're, they're, they're not, but, but, but after, but if I would have told you, that after Cal got abandoned by the t- by the Pac-12, Big Ten, and Big 12 defectors and had their fourth offensive play caller in three seasons, that game day would be headed to Berkeley. Oh, and they were and they barely lost to Florida State too. They could be four and oh right now. Cause they're oh. one of the best stories in college football. And oh. you know, if they could have finished that drive against Florida State, if I had told you that, would you have believed me? No, I would have been I would have been like, man, you're crazy. <laughs> Come on now. I mean, and they should have beat Florida State and they picked the worst time to play their worst game yep. probably for years. That was a horrible game by Cal. I don't know if it was a game plan, but it was just not a not a good day for Cal against Florida State because they're a better football team than they showed against Florida State. But I, I love it. I you know, I was at first I was like, man, it's kind of a head scratcher to come out to Cal for game day, but I love it. I love it for the fans at Cal. Everybody deserves to, to experience that. It's such a great environment. And for me, like you said, Mario Crystal Ball coming back to the West Coast. And really, he's got a he's got a, an identity crisis of losing to bad football teams. Not just bad yes. football teams. That was not bad. But losing to inferior football teams maybe with talent, right? And I remember there was a lot of Oregon fans, and I'll give them credit, uh, that would say, hey, it's not the good teams you got to worry about with Mario Crystal Ball. It's, Correct. It's the- Lower tier teams. You yes, about. You know what I mean? because in trying to be so physical, they end up in rock fights, and right. then you have a penalty or a, a miraculous catch or something, and now all of a sudden you got a problem on your on your hands. 
And well, that's the Mario Cristobal experience. And I've been trying to tell Miami fans. Because we watched Cam Ward play for multiple years in the Pac-12. Cam Ward's a good quarterback, but they don't under, They started to understand the Virginia Tech game. They're like, oh, yeah, but it's just a bad game. I was like, no, that's the Cam Ward experience. He is going to be good. And then, but when the, when, yes, it is this roller coaster ride of holding the ball too long sometimes. He'll make a heroic play and then he'll do stuff where you're just like, oh my God, what are you doing? He'll, like, there have been times where I've seen him just run out, run out of bounds instead of throwing the ball out of bounds and essentially take an eight yard sack. And I'm like, what are you doing? Just throw the ball. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean, that's, people don't understand. They need to turn on the Apple Cup. When, when, when Cam Ward played the Huskies last year, those are things that you got to understand is that he's extremely talented. I mean, yes. he's one of the most quarterbacks in college football. I love watching him play when he's playing well. But it's very similar to a guy that just might have a brain fart once in a while. Like you said, I've seen him take horrendous sacks. That was one of the greatest things I've ever seen. He's playing UW. It's like a 12, he's 12 yards behind the line of scrimmage. Nobody's by him, but nobody's open. He runs the ball with his hand out of bounds. I'm like, yeah. dude. Oh, yeah, just throw, yeah, like just throw it out of bounds. Where it's like third and forty, right? I mean, it's I mean, those are the things that, that they're gonna see because he's coming back to the West Coast. Cal knows Cam Ward. They played against him several times. There's a situation where, you know, um, Coach Wilcox knows what he's doing on defense. Yeah. Okay. Their offense has always been challenged, but on defense, they're gonna find a way to make him uncomfortable. And I think it's gonna be one of those things where um, if they can make Cam Ward uncomfortable. If they can force him into making some mistakes, throwing some interceptions, fumbling the ball, he has a tendency sometimes to run with that ball like a breadbasket where he's got yep. that ball out there. They're going to find a way. They're going to be punching at that ball. There's going to be lots of things that happen. So when you play Cal, you got to be ready for anything. Like I said, uh, up there at UW, we got the, the, the crazy lightning storm, finished with no stand, uh, fans in the stadium, finished at like 3 a.m. Cal's going to – this weird stuff happens. Okay, so yep. Miami fans need to be ready. They need to mentally prepare themselves <laughs> for something crazy to happen. Not just Pac-12 after dark, but it's Cal. And it's yes. Cal after dark. So it's yep. going to be wild. It's gonna be something, something's going to happen. Just wait and see. Something's going to happen. Yeah, and Jaden Ott, if he's able to be healthy, because he's been banged up a little bit um, since the UC Davis game was when he sprained his ankle. But then Javian Thomas stepped up against San Diego State. And their quarterback, Fernando Mendoza, he's actually made some uh, big throws to N Nazia Hunter. And if we're being honest, like this offense, like you said, is still a work in progress. But, but Justin Wilcox's bread and butter has been the defense over the last couple of years. And then they got 6'6", 280, Xavier Carlton, who has been pass rushing his ass off. And the defense already has 10 interceptions. And yeah. Cam Ward faced this Cal defense twice when he was at Washington State. And both times threw for a ton of yards, but he also had a bunch of costly turnovers. Because he's yeah. super talented, but he does have them, uh, I, I'll call them Will, Will Levis plays. Yeah, 100%. And, and yeah. and this is Miami's second year with Shannon Dawson calling plays. And this year they actually look like the old Clayton Toon Houston offenses instead of playing that Mario Cristobal ground and pound. And maybe he's letting, you know, getting his thumb off of this team. But, you know, defensively, good teams can push Miami around a little bit. But the Hurricanes have also been ball hawks. They got nine interceptions of their own. And I think whoever protects the ball more is going to come out with a win. And uh, if, if I am taking the points, of course, I'm taking Cal in this 10 and a half points. But I'm actually picking Cal in an upset. Nice. I love that. I don't know if I can do that just because um, I love that you're picking Cal, though, too. Because, I mean, West Coast, let's go. And, and it's, it's Miami coming over to West Coast. I, I love the idea of the upset just because they're coming from so far, the, the time difference, all that stuff. But uh, I'll definitely take Cal plus the points. I think Miami's going to find a way to win. I yeah. think you're absolutely right. When you talk about Mario Crystal Ball finally realizing that he needs to step away from the offense and let someone totally take that off so they can start being more explosive. They bring yep. in a kid for, who is supposed to be a guy that gets him into that 35, 40 points a game, right? 
So he has to step back and, and, and get away from that ground and pound. And, hey, we're just going to run the football and control the ball. And, and he's an offensive lineman. He's, a, he's an old school hurricane offensive lineman. So to me, I think you're right. Miami's on the cusp. You know, I really like Miami. I think, I think Miami was, you know, they're, they're a true top 10 team if they continue to find a way yeah. to get King Ford in situations where he's successful. So that to me is the key for Miami, not just this game, but moving forward is to find ways to keep Cam Ward comfortable to where he does not make those silly mistakes, right? So 100%. force him to almost be a two or three read guy, get rid of the ball, right? And, and hey, Cam, throw the ball away. Hey, if you got to take a sack, take a sack for two or three yards, not 12. Just finding a way to really rein him in because he's a really special player. Yeah. But comes back to the offense coordinator and really, really reining in him to where you can use him at, at his strengths. And not yep. and get rid of those weaknesses, but I'm taking Miami. But I do like Cal plus the points. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. You you, you just got to put a governor on them. Yep. <laughs> um, so uh, we got SMU at Louisville. So where the hell did Southern Methodist University come from? Because they the Mustangs they look terrible against Nevada in the opener and against BYU just three weeks ago. But it turns out that just making a change at quarterback might be the biggest thing that they needed to do because BYU is honestly making everybody look terrible that they've played right now. And SMU might just be one of them second tier teams in the ACC, which is good. And in the last two weeks against TCU and Florida state, Rhett Lashley's team has scored 108 points. And they did that by supporting with the switch to Kevin Jennings at quarterback and running the hell out of the football because they've had over 40 carries in a row. Well, 40 games, 40 carries in the last two games in a row. And they're nine and oh, the last two seasons when they're running the ball at least 40 times. But the question is, is that going to work against Louisville? Because they've developed into one of the best run defenses in the country under defensive coordinator Mark Hagan and Ron English. So, uh, so yeah, so SMU might have to take the training wheels off of Kevin Jennings this week if they're going to win this football game. And yeah. uh, it, Louisville is a seven-point favorite, just so you know. So it's it's interesting to me because I'll be honest with you, I, I was a, I was ready to write off SMU when I watched that Nevada game. Oh, said, me too. I was like, oh, they stink. I mean, they were terrible, and I think they were like I want to say a big favorite. I want to yes, say like they were. Yeah, they were eight. like twenty some point favorites. Yeah, and I'm thinking to myself, man, well, SMU is terrible. I mean, Nevada should have won that game, and, and it yeah. was one of those things where and Nevada's uh, bad. Yeah, and they're bad, and and that's what Nevada's a couple years away. I mean, from from actually competing even at the Mountain West level. So yes. to me, I'm thinking, man, geez, these guys, they're not ready for the ACC. Give them a couple years. I kind of wrote them off. Then they played BYU tough. And one thing that bothers me so much is, I tell you what, BYU is nasty right now. BYU mm -hmm. is whipping everybody. And I did not see that coming. And I'll tell you one thing. I, I owe a lot of people apology because I'm hard on BYU. Just because I don't like BYU from the 1984 situation. They talk so much trash to UW. UW always thumps them. But it was one of those things where BYU deserves a lot of credit. I know we're not talking about BYU, but they have been phenomenal the last couple of weeks. They deserve their credit. Yes. But when it comes to, to SMU and Louisville, Louisville's quietly been uh, been building, I think, a, a really nice roster. I think their coaching staff is really good. I think yep. they're one of those right now where it's, it's you know, they, they, they had a hard-fought game last week where they had to find a way to get When they played Georgia Tech, it was very similar. I mean, it was a game where they were heavily favored. They got hit in the mouth. They had to come out and really build themselves up and, and find their character and find a way to win the game. But when you look at Louisville and this SMU, the rosters to me are totally different. I think that Louisville has built a really nice roster. I think their QB can play. I think their defense is really good. They're similar to like a cow team where that, that defense is going to be their bread and butter. And they're going to get out to that quarterback. You talk about Jennings. Jennings has got to be, I think, really, really good for SMU to have a chance. Where's this game at? Is it at, at uh, Louisville? Uh, yes, this game's at Louisville. Yeah, I just, I don't see SMU finding a way, because it would be a ranked win for yes. on the road for SMU. They just don't have the roster yet. Even though they got money down there, they got the oil tycoon. Yeah, big, yeah, yeah, it's going to take a couple, yeah, it's going to take a couple cycles for them get their to roster ramp up. Where they can go on the road and beat a really good ranked uh, team. So I'm taking Louisville in this game, and I might even take the, uh, Louisville uh, minus the points just because oh, I'm taking 
I am taking Louisville <laughs> minus the the points because when you like really analyze that Notre Dame game last week, uh, yeah. the the first thing I did because I went back and watched the game after the game was was over with was I was like, how the hell? So I, I looked at the stat line first because the first thing, I, the thing I've been most concerned about with Notre Dame is their quarterback play with Riley Leonard. And so I was like, okay, he only threw for 100 and some yards. They only rushed for 100 and some yards. How did they have 280 total yards of offense and score 31 points? Yeah. And then I looked, Louisville turned the ball over three times. So like Tyler Shuck, the former Oregon quarterback, went down to Texas Tech, now at Louisville. He's been gearing up for his fifth consecutive full regular season game, something that injuries prevented him from doing his last three years at Texas Tech. But the kid looks good. And Jeff and Brian Brom like it more when Shug is picking his spots instead of just carrying the entire offense. And this Louisville defense is good. And people are going to look at that Notre Dame loss and "Ah, just write them off. But no, they are a tough out. This is a team that can beat Clemson. This is a team that can beat Miami as long as they don't turn the football over because they held Notre Dame, which is not a good offense, down to not being a good offense. They just gave up a lot of points because they had three turnovers. Right. No, I agree 100%. I think that I'm glad you brought that up because when you look at the stat line, which I did just recently, I was blown away at how Notre Dame scored so many points. Yes. And it was exactly what you said. I'm like, man, what, what, where did the points come from? But – if Louisville finds a way to just maybe only give up one turnover, you don't even have to be totally clean, right? If you just only cough it up one time, that game's either a Louisville win or really, really tight. So to me, Louisville's a good football team. That's where you got to find a way to be clean. And that's where it comes with a guy like Shook. you got a guy that comes in where if you can find a way to just do your job on defense, right? Try to keep them to three, try to keep them to three, don't give up a bunch of touchdowns and then take care of the football, right? Yep. Don't give up big plays on special teams. That's what Louisville's in to me because they got the talent. Their roster is pretty solid, but I think their defense is what's going to win the day because if they can find a way, like you said, to not turn the ball over, they got a chance against anybody. And that's exactly what you said. Yep. Uh, the last game I want to talk about briefly, I didn't m- m- mention it to you, but I'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the Oregon Ducks for a quick quick second because Michigan State heads out to Autzen Stadium which uh, they're 24 point favorites and when the college football 25 came out I got very upset because when they ranked the toughest places to play I was like uh, yes they had Oregon at at 11 I was like first of all Oregon should not be number 11 they should be in the top 10 and also Washington and Utah are completely under. I was like, have y'all never been there? Exactly. Have y'all never been there? Because um, I didn't go to the Washington game last year up there, but people who right. went said that was the most wow. electric college football environment. Oh, Josh, Josh, Josh Pate was the one who, who said to me, he was like, that honestly might be like top three environments I've ever been in. It was wild. Wow. Absolutely wild. Yep. No, I- I want to talk about that just for a second because obviously, I mean, I, I got to go reminisce, man, because we're having a rough, we're three and two right now. I got to go back to that time in my mind. But man, <laughs> that game was so much fun. And really, it was great because the Oregon fans are great. And I know Oregon and, and me and, 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 and Oregon fans, we go out at Twitter and stuff, but there were so many great Oregon fans there. And, and, and there's so many great Oregon fans that come up to, to UW games when we play them and vice versa. But so many Oregon fans, even after the game, because it was a blowing loss for, for yeah. Oregon. Iowa. But, I mean, they were like, dude, that, that was one of the greatest games I'll ever go yes, to. Yes, it's a three-point game that came down to a field goal. That's oh, what – this is what I try to tell college football fans all the time when they get to talking about these schedules and justifying the schedules. I on it, As much as I do not want the Ducks to lose, I would rather see that every single week – than, than like a 70 to six game. I, I don't want to see that. I agree hundred percent. That, that's, I mean, that was one of the, the, the best experience. Like I told, like I took my brother up to the game or on the field. I mean, it was unreal. And it was one of those things where we'll remember that day forever. And I would remember that day forever if it would have went the other way, because yep. that game was so amazing. I mean, the game was unreal on both sides of the ball and the people that played in that game, the players on the field. I mean, these guys were elite. Yep. NFL, all pro. These guys are going to be amazing in the NFL. 
So that was a once in a lifetime opportunity where we want to have more games like that. That's the best type of game. But that was so much fun, man. You want to talk about electric? That's that's what that's what college football is right there. Facts. Um, Oregon is hosting Michigan State this weekend, and I am I am con- conflicted because I love Aiden Childs. I've known him for a very long time, Michigan State's quarterback. But this going I I want him to play clean. But there's yeah. no way that Oregon dominates the, the the game and and he ends up okay. <laughs> like there's like there's no way. So yeah. I am gonna be looking at this game so excited, but I'm gonna be like, oh no, it, it, it's gonna be hard. Um, I like Jonathan Smith. I think that he's gonna be a good coach at Michigan State. But it's like Oregon State. He's a he's a builder. He, him, yeah. Jed Fish, guys like that. Like they're builders. Like they're it's not gonna be the overnight. Uh, fix, right? It's going to be a three, four year fix, even with the transfer portal, because they're culture guys. They're going to build it. I actually think Oregon is going to get either close to covering this spread or covering it. Um, I just want to see them put together one more really good performance before I like. I want to see them have their best performance this year. That way, headed into the Ohio State game, they are playing with maximum confidence. That way we get one of those games like you just talked about. Yeah, no, 100%. And I agree with you, man. Oregon's got way too much firepower. I mean, when you talk about uh, Michigan State, you you hit it right on the head. Jonathan Smith's amazing coach. He's an amazing guy. I loved him when he was at Washington. Loved him when he was at Oregon State. He, he's just a great coach. He's a great dude, and he's building something at Michigan State, but it, it's going to take time. Their yep. roster is going to get, con- you know, put together and constructed the way that he wants it. But it's going to be two, three years before they start challenging for a college football playoff spot. And I just see this being a really rough spot for Aiden Childs in this offense and really this defense coming into to, to Eugene. So I, I think you're right. I think Oregon covers this spread. I think Oregon right now is starting to figure it out. They look pretty terrible against Idaho. Yes. And, and even Boise, it was really, really good. So I, I, don't, I don't really – I mean, that game was a tough game. I think Boise State's a top 25 team. So, um, But that Idaho game, they just didn't know. They didn't have an identity. They didn't know no. who they were yet. I mean, um, but and, now. And that's what we talked about too, right? About building yeah. teams versus building cultures. That right. they've been able to survive. So now it looks like you're kind of starting to figure it out. So you're just hoping that either by October 12th that you have figured it out or that that is the thing that fully clicks that way then you can keep building and end up with a 10 and 2 11 and 1 record that's going to get you into the the 12 team playoff and just be playing your best football at that point in time. No, I agree 100%. I mean, that that Oregon team, you know, selfishly I was hoping that they take longer to figure it out, but right now they they look like they they figured it out. I mean, yeah. They, they have too much talent. I mean, that offense and that offensive line that was giving them problems early in the season, they've really cleaned that up. I yep. mean, they're able to run the ball. They can pass the ball over the lot. But really, their defense is what scares me. Their defense is nasty, bro. I mean, yes. they're going to have a bunch of NFL dudes that come off that defense. And if they can find a way to stay healthy, I just don't see anybody really challenging them, especially with that they got Ohio State at home. They got UW at home. I mean, their schedule yeah, matches. The schedule, yeah. UW's schedule. UW's got a freaking gauntlet down down the rest of the way. I think yeah. Oregon's schedule sets up really nice for the rest of the way. But yeah, I don't see Michigan State giving Oregon any problems at all. Um, I think it could be close for a half. I mean, it could be you know where maybe uh, Michigan State's only yeah, down. Jonathan maybe- State Smith knows what's going yeah. on. He's been to Austin, so he's going to be able to help his right. team. And and before we get out of here, Jordan, I will tell you, there is one thing that used to annoy me so much last year that a player did on the field. And for some reason, I like it now. Yeah. Oh, you like that now. That's right. Yeah. Muhammad, I should be like, get your sorry ass up off the field. (laughs) Like, but now. (laughs) Right. That's right. Close that box up, baby. Oh, yeah. (laughs) crazy about this whole deal too is that you know i look at oregon secondary and now i'm like and and honestly when you look at oregon's football team to me they're so stacked i'm surprised that they can keep guys on that roster because they got two deeps and three deeps 
of guys that would be starters at other Big Ten well, teams. Well, they're right? playing what they – so I so I thought the same thing. And then after talking to the coaches and then watching the film and figuring it, figuring it out, if you notice, pay, think – Think back or kind of gaze back on some of the games. Aside from quarterback and offensive line, they're rotating a ton of guys. So yeah. their whole thing has been: we're going to find who should be playing in the big games. So we're right. going to give. So we're going to try to keep everybody as fresh as possible because they are so deep. So there hasn't been, aside from Evan Stewart at wide receiver, who I who I don't think has had enough touches, who probably could be right. a little bit frustrated right now. Aside from that, I think that. Everybody has been – there's been so much rotation that now yeah. you get a chance to play fresh all the time. And then when yeah. you get in them big games, I think that's when you're going to start to see the the rotation pare down a little bit. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that I think you're right. And, and, and really, they have to do that nowadays too. But when you have that much talent, you're not really – you know, when we were playing, you know, the twos and threes, just because of the way rosters were back then, you yeah. have a drop. Now, Oregon doesn't have a drop-off because they got another five-star dude or four-star dude yeah. or a dude talented behind them, you know? So, and you got to keep everybody happy, right? Because you want to keep that roster together because these these coaches now, and Dan Lanning, I, I you know, I love Dan Lanning. I, I want to hate him, but I really do because he is so energetic. He's a young coach, and he's a guy that I think really relates with players. And, and to me, he has managed that roster really well because in the offseason, I talked about how Oregon might have some problem in that locker room because of the just the stacking on stacking on stacking. Yeah. But he's really managed that roster so well. He deserves a ton of credit because obviously they're, they're undefeated and they should continue to win. But, I mean, what he's done with recruiting, but then also keeping that roster intact, that to me, he's hustling, bro. Like he yeah. works his to keep that roster intact and to recruit. So he deserves a ton of credit, man, and, and – um, and the way that he stayed at Eugene, and, and I don't know if he got offered that job at Alabama. I think Coach DeBoer was always the number one guy. But yeah. the way that he, that he played that and the way that he said the grass is damn you know, green in Eugene yeah. and stuff, that stuff, he's played his hand perfectly. Very well. Yep. Perfectly. And, 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 and where you said that it was hard to hate him, Jordan, um, so Washington fans were surprised with some of my commentary on Washington last last year. They were like, this is surprisingly honest. I was like, I'm just going to tell, tell the truth. Dude, it was so – I could not hate Michael Penix last year. It was oh, the most frustrating because – and it was because I watched him at Indiana and I was rooting for him. Yeah. And yeah. then to see him come and play well because they were like, oh, he's just a runner. And to see him throw the ball in there, I was like, this dude's good, man. And then he works out at 3D Q QB. My sons work out there. He's been nice to my kids. Oh, yeah. How the hell am I going to hate the kid? Like, it's impossible to hate somebody who's nice to your kids. Oh, yeah. No, I love that, man. Well, and, and what's funny, though, too, is that, you know, for me, and I know you're the same way, is that, you know, we're all ball players, you know? So, like, when it comes to football players, we all support each other. Even though we're on different teams, if we're playing each other, we're going to hate each other. Yeah. But, like, we're around each other. We're always supporting our brothers, right? I mean, when yep. you're a football, you're a brother, right? So whether it's a duck or whatever, I mean, it's the fans mainly that really get that vitriol going, you know. Yeah. But I love, I mean, I love good football, man. Yeah. And when I start watching some of these guys, and when I see an Oregon start ramping up, I'm like, oh no, oh <laughs> yes, dude. I was like, when Washington was in the national championship, I was like, on one hand. I want them to stop talking shit about the Pac-12, but another hand, oh, they're gonna be unsufferable. It, it, it's like you, you, you like the people, but you hate the logo. Oh yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. The way it's always been. I mean, it's one of those things where it's like, man, I mean, I played with Dennis Dixon uh, at at, at uh, in Pittsburgh. Yeah, and me and great friends. I mean, and and, and when, when we're out there, and I'm like, man, and I played against him, and I and when I played against him, I hate. Him. I mean, yeah. I was like, man. That's this dude. This dude is elite. He's electric. I'm like, get that skinny ass over here. Let me. I couldn't even touch him, you know. And and I mean, I remember watching Jonathan Stewart. Like people used to make fun of me. There was some play that they played Oregon all the time where he was stiff arming me, actually me, like yeah. on the, you know. And I was like, dude, that dude was an absolute. I, I'm honored to be yeah. stiff arming. He was a first round NFL pick with a long <laughs> NFL career. Yeah, he's supposed to do that sometimes. Yeah, that's that's what he does, you know. So. I mean, it's, it's just different, you know what I mean, when, when, with the guys that played, because we all go through the same thing, and we're yep. all pulling for 
other to be successful. We don't want guys getting hurt. I mean, that's what it's all about, you know, because when it, when it comes down to it, I mean, football players got to stick together when it comes to, you know, when they're talking about the NFL guys, I mean, it's, it's very similar in the NFL. I mean, college is, is great because we're passionate and it's, it's the pageantry and it's yeah. the pride. Right. And so it's just a different type of pride when, when you play, but, but like I said, it's, it's hard. It's hard not to root for – I don't root for Dan Lanning, but it's hard not to like him. Because appreciate, I, yeah. Yeah, where you can appreciate such it. such a good job, and and, and I, he's doing way better than I think anybody thought, and he deserves a ton of credit because, dude, the dude recruits his ass off, and then he, he manages that roster. I mean, the, the players love him, and uh, it'll be interesting to see. But I do want to talk about, you know, when you talk about Washington – Fans need to cool down on the jet fish, you know, it's terrible and all this stuff. But I knew it was going to happen. I mean, it happened when Kalen DeBoer was 4-2 and and he lost to Arizona State and then UCLA. This is going to take some time. Washington is not going to compete for a national championship there. Washington's not going to compete for a CFP spot this year. I thought they had a small window. Uh, If they would have found a way to to, to finish those games to be 5-0, they might have been able to get to that 8-9 wins. But right now, looking at Washington needs to get to a bowl game and then win that bowl game, focus on recruiting, and then look at 25 and 26 because of the way that that roster is. It's just the way. And Jed has shown he will go out and go get players. He will find. And, and, um, and uh, Scotty, Scotty Graham will find great running backs. Oh, Scotty Graham's a stud, man. Yes. uh, I love that dude. And honestly, that staff is, is done really well. Belichick on like game day. Their defense and offense has been amazing. I mean, their yards per play. I mean, you cannot take anything away from what they've done on the field. It's just the penalties. And that comes back to culture and building a culture and finding a way to get leadership within that locker room. And right now, there's so many different spider webs. Guys got to come together. And who is the real leader, right? So it's going to take some time. But Washington's close. Oregon is there. Oregon is there. Washington. Washington was there last year. Washington could have won a national championship last year, obviously. Oregon is there now. We're going to find out October 12th. But their roster is built for it right now. I don't think Dylan Gabriel is anything close to even Bo Nix or no. Michael Penn. No, I, but I will definitely. I, I completely – I tweeted this out uh, uh, after the second or third game of the season. I was like – Damn, I I think I underrated. I knew Bo, Bo Nix was good. I, I, I think I underestimated how good he was in college. Oh yeah, no, Bo Nix didn't get the credit he deserved. I mean, and and I think people thought that Dylan Gabriel was going to be like a plug and play, and yeah. it was going to Bo Nix situation. He's not. He he is not a Bo Nix level guy. He's a good football player. Yeah, he's they can win you a lot of games. Uh, but but Oregon's so good in other aspects. You know, they don't need him to be the Bo Nix of, yeah. of the last. Correct. And uh, you guys, I'm George Reister. He is Jordan Reffitt. You can find him on Twitter talking to all things college football and supporting the Washington Huskies. You guys, make sure that you guys like, subscribe, tell a friend about the show, get notifications, and come back every single day because we have dope content. Jordan, thanks for coming on, man. Hey, I love it, man. Keep doing what you're doing. You're doing an awesome job, brother. Appreciate it.